Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, after days of pressure, Ontario's Premier reinstates some restrictions. If we don't act now, it's going to get worse. What it means for businesses and social activities. This will provide support to businesses directly. Ottawa announces new help for commercial renters. In my heart and my mind, it was, he's still alive. I just need to, I just need to touch him. Her son is dead. Why police are under investigation. And stand-up routines for Zoom call crowds. As a comedian, you're not getting any feedback. Why comedy's even harder in the time of COVID. This is The National. In many parts of Canada, COVID-19 cases are reaching record levels. Time for solutions may be running out. And new modelling from Ottawa today paints a stark picture of what the coming weeks could bring. The epidemic potential of the epidemic curve is clear. We need people to do everything they can to prevent transmission of this virus. There are forecasts for three scenarios. If Canadians relax their guard and increase contacts, case rates will rocket far beyond anything we've seen. But even if we continue doing what we're doing now, the projections aren't much better. The only way to get COVID-19 back under control, according to the models, is to decrease contacts. The situation in Ontario, a key part of that challenge. Over the past month, the average daily rate of new cases in Ontario has tripled. And the number of patients in the hospital with COVID has quadrupled. Today, Ontario reported a record 939 new infections, most in the hotspots of Ottawa, Toronto and neighbouring Peel. In those three regions, schools and stores may remain open, but as of midnight tonight, many businesses will shut down. As Katie Nicholson explains, the road after that won't be easy. This will be the last supper at Avelo for a while. We put in these acrylic walls. Roger Yang took safety very seriously before he reopened his restaurant. After spending thousands in protective measures, he's shutting down again. We're obviously really disappointed that we have to close, but I also see that it's, it's necessary for us as an industry, uh, it's necessary for us as a society. After days of pressure from public health figures in COVID hotspots, the province is returning to a partial shutdown for the next 28 days. For Ottawa, Toronto and Peel, that means an end to indoor drinking and dining. Gyms are shuttered, so are casinos and movie theatres. And for people across Ontario, new guidance. We are also advising everyone to limit trips outside their homes except for essential purposes such as work, school, groceries, medical appointments and socially distant outdoor physical activity. The move comes as hospitals are feeling the strain and critical care and emergency numbers surge upward, though still far from where they were in the first wave. Now you've got people backing up into the emergency department and hallway medicine getting worse and that becomes very, very problematic in a pandemic situation. There's criticism too. While these steps are necessary, perhaps they're coming a little late. I'd wish we had done something earlier. Maybe would not have needed to be as heavy handed as we are now had we done this a couple of weeks earlier. Had we not opened bars to the levels we had at all until schools were already open and up and running. That would have been the wiser tack to take. Forced now to cancel a full slate of Saturday reservations, Yang agrees. It would have been better to do this sooner. It would have been better to, to uh, have a better plan to begin with. Um, and not just restaurants, for other indoor businesses. So Katie, the new rules coming into effect not long from now. How are people reacting tonight? Well, Ian, on a day where we posted such high numbers, you might think that it might be a little bit more of a muted Friday night in downtown Toronto, but it is not. Uh, we just went by a sort of quite festive bar scene. Uh, just behind us, there's a restaurant with a couple of dozen people inside, um, and we're certainly seeing uh, people really sort of pushing the max. This is their one last hurrah, I guess, to eat and drink inside for the next 28 days. Maybe not taking the messaging so seriously uh, or are afraid of being cooped up. And one of the things public health officials tell us, when you make a restriction like this, it's really a fine balance between what people should do and what people can live with. Ian? All right, Katie, thank you. Well, as we often do, let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogosh. And, and Dr. Bogosh, soaring numbers in Ontario and Quebec and, and some pretty significant changes in policy. What do you make of those? 
I think it's the right move. And I appreciate that there's always going to be some drawback to this, economic and psychological drawbacks to this. But at the end of the day, the case numbers are so high that you're just past the point where focused and targeted restrictions were going to get the job done. And sadly, a more blunt instrument was, was needed to get these under control. So you are one doctor working in one big Toronto hospital, but uh, in terms of what you're seeing, what sort of impact is there or isn't there yet from this second wave of COVID? Oh, we, we're already starting to see cases. And in fact, over the course of the summer, we had a period of time where there were no COVID-19 cases admitted to the hospital. But every day we're admitting more and more. We're seeing them on the hospital wards. And sadly, some of them are, are making their way into the intensive care unit. And of course, if we don't do anything, if we don't pivot, that case number is going to rise as community cases rise. So I'm glad that the province finally pivoted and took steps to get these under control in the community so that we hopefully have fewer cases admitted to the hospital. All right, Dr. Bogosh, thank you. My pleasure. There is some good news for Canada. Despite the virus, while cases have been going up, hiring has been on the rise as well. 378,000 jobs were added to the economy in September as the unemployment rate continues to go down. Now, that rate is still 9%, but that is far better than in the spring. September job gains were better than expected. Economists are giving some of the credit to school reopenings, which frees up parents to work. Overall, Canada has gained back about three quarters of the jobs lost during the pandemic. But for the virus, September was a long time ago. Another pandemic blow for businesses is likely on the way. Olivia Stefanovic shows us Ottawa's new strategy to help businesses pay the rent even when COVID-19 closes their doors. Go enjoy your last for a while. Yeah, thank you. Facing yet another shutdown order, Amber Stratton is worried about the future of her four yoga studios. When you start to do the math over the long term, I just don't know how many places are going to be able to survive it. It's, it's really sad. She was using the federal government's previous rent relief program, but it ended last month. It offered cash to landlords to help cover for tenants who couldn't make rent. But some landlords, including one of Stratton's, didn't apply. They would only get the rent relief if we promised to re-sign another five-year lease. And with us not knowing what's going to happen, that was probably, uh, I felt like a little bit of an unfair situation. Now the federal government is taking a different approach. With the new Canada Emergency Rent Subsidy. This will provide support to businesses directly. Businesses who've taken a hit on revenue can apply for a partial break on rent, but it's a sliding scale. So it's not one size fits all. There is a range of support you get with your rent based on what your fall in revenue is. Businesses forced to close their doors due to public health orders can get up to 90% of their rent covered. This is really good news. It will help tens of thousands of businesses make it over the fall and into the winter period. But for those facing another round of shutdowns, this is not going to be enough. But for Stratton, it's a lifeline. She no longer has to worry about her biggest expense. We don't feel like we have to be jumping through the hoops and having the landlords make the decisions. Instead, the government's stepping up and, and <laughs> working directly with us, which is really beneficial. The question now is how long it will take for the money to start flowing. The legislation needs to pass the House of Commons, which won't sit for another week. Olivia Stepanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. Two regions of New Brunswick have been forced back into the province's more restrictive orange phase of COVID-19 recovery. The move comes after 13 new cases were confirmed on Friday. That brings the active total to 37. It is not an easy choice to move any area of this province to orange. But we must all use the tools available for us to slow down the spread of this virus. Residents in the Moncton and Campbellton zones will now have to stick to two household bubbles. Other rollbacks include the closing of gyms and hair salons. Contact tracing is an essential tool to stop the spread of the coronavirus. It's well in hand in New Brunswick, but in some provinces, the case numbers are rising so fast, far more resources are needed. As Salima Shivji shows, it didn't have to be that way. Remember this? Health Canada is building an inventory of specialized work volunteers that provinces and territories can draw on. Back in April, the call for Canadians to help contact trace was urgent. If you can help, 
please sign up online. Kevin McIntyre, working on his PhD in epidemiology, thought he fit the bill perfectly. His girlfriend signed up too. We have the base skills of epidemiology, so we figured kind of it was inevitable we were going to get called to um, help. And then kind of months, weeks and months went by. With no call. He even took special courses to learn the ins and outs of contact tracing. Still, no call. In the meantime, parts of Canada felt a second wave. Ontario now overwhelmed, struggling to trace infections, spreading exponentially. Quite upset with the provincial government that we're at this point. This was not inevitable. The disused database of volunteers left many of them, more than 50,000, exasperated, like Paul Baker. I found it very frustrating and disappointing that our leaders could not sort of work this out in their minds. Ottawa may have put out the call for volunteers, but the provinces control tracing, and they didn't use the database. Now the federal government is helping several provinces like Quebec and Ontario with tracing through Statistics Canada. Employees like Cindy Petrie seconded to an Ontario contact tracing team. On a lot of my calls, I am actually getting um, thank yous from the individuals that they're re- are reaching out to. More help is coming, says the Premier, but not from volunteers. We're going to be hiring hundreds and hundreds of contact tracers. So why did this volunteer idea fail? Chalk it up to a symptom of Canada's federation. Ottawa thinking one thing, the province is another. A disconnect more keenly felt in a pandemic. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Now to the United States, where the Commission on Presidential Debates today cancelled a second face-off between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. This after the president declined to do a virtual debate. Katie Simpson shows us just how keen Trump is to dismiss any possible risk from his bout of COVID-19. This celebration in the White House Rose Garden to honour the president's pick for Supreme Court nominee is being given a new harsh label by the country's top infectious disease expert. We had a super spreader event in the White House and it was in a situation where people were crowded together and were not wearing masks. The world will find out tomorrow whether any lessons have been learned and physical distancing will be enforced as Donald Trump is set to deliver his first public remarks here since his COVID diagnosis. I feel better now than I did two weeks ago. It's crazy. And I recovered immediately, almost immediately. I might not have recovered at all. Trump's doctor says it is safe for him to resume public engagements as of Saturday, as 10 days will have passed since first testing positive. On Monday, he will travel to Florida for a rally, though some question whether any of this is safe. From the information that we have, had moderate to severe uh, COVID uh, viral infection. And for those patients, if you look at the CDC guidelines, they could be contagious for up to 20 days. His reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis The destabilizing effect it's having on our government is unconscionable. The president's doctors have released few specifics about his illness, and no officials will confirm when the president last tested negative, (laughs) leaving questions as to whether Trump skirted testing rules ahead of last week's debate. Did the president at least comply with the Cleveland Clinic debate requirements to be negative tested in the 72 hours prior to that debate? Was was the president in compliance with that? Now, Katie, the the president is trying to assure voters that he is, in fact, healthy and agreed to be examined by a doctor for a reality TV special. What happened? Uh, It was more of an interview, Ian, than it was originally billed. And the president went into more detail about his experience with COVID, explaining how he felt when he was admitted to hospital. I think didn't feel strong, didn't feel really strong. I didn't have a problem with breathing, which a lot of people seem to have. Uh, I had none of that. Uh, But uh, I didn't feel very strong. I didn't feel very vital. It is worth pointing out, Ian, that Donald Trump did require supplemental oxygen to assist with his breathing. The president was asked if there are any lessons to be learned here, anything the public can take away about preventing the spread of COVID. Trump focused on his own personal case, saying his recovery is because of his early access to medicine. He did not make any pitch for physical distancing. He also says he's still waiting for the results of his latest COVID test. Even though the results are not in, his campaign is pushing ahead with his speech tomorrow and a rally on Monday. Just think, it was just a week ago he went by helicopter to hospital. Katie Simpson, thank you. Thanks. 
COVID-19 could shape U.S. politics in another way. Republicans are in a hurry to confirm the president's new Supreme Court nominee, but will they have enough votes? Paul Hunter has that angle. With the U.S. flag still flying half-staff outside the Supreme Court building in Washington, it's a reminder the business of replacing the late Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg remains unfinished. We're literally in an election. Just this week in the vice presidential debate, pushback against Republican steps to move quickly on Donald Trump's nominee, staunch conservative Amy Coney Barrett, said Democrat Kamala Harris, slow down. Let the American people fill that seat in the White House, and then we'll fill that seat on the United States Supreme Court. Republicans who control the confirmation process insist not a chance. But all of a sudden, COVID is the wild card. At that now infamous Rose Garden ceremony introducing Barrett, after which Trump tested positive, among the handful of others who also became ill with it were two Republican senators involved in the upcoming hearings on Barrett, Tom Tillis and Mike Lee. A third Republican senator, Ron Johnson, tested positive separately. Altogether, it's a potential game changer in a Senate where Republicans hold a bare majority. Slim majorities, complicated rules, and the uncertainty of the virus. Political scientist Sarah Binder calls it unprecedented, though she believes Republicans on Capitol Hill can find a way past most hurdles on this. There's one rule that cannot be ignored. Senators, even if sick, cannot vote from home. They do have to show up on the floor or in the galleries <laughs> uh, in order to vote by voice um, on a nomination. And though one of the senators now ill, Johnson, has already said he'd even wear a moon suit to come vote. Binder underlines this is, after all, 2020. We don't know whether other senators uh, will uh, get infected, and we don't know whether the infected senators will get sick. Not to mention the effect on those who'd need to come vote amid others who might well be contagious. Too risky? Will it actually go ahead before the November election? The short answer may well be, it's up to that virus. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Former Quebec Liberal Premier Jean Charest is suing the province, alleging he's been unfairly targeted by Quebec's anti-corruption unit. Charest says that he wouldn't have sued if the province had apologized publicly or had used mediation to come to an agreement. He says an investigation into the financing of the province's Liberal Party led to details of his private life being illegally leaked to the media. The former Premier is claiming more than $1 million in damages. A grieving Ottawa family wants answers after a young man plunged 12 floors to his death following a police raid. The officers did what's called a dynamic entry, bursting into the apartment with no warning. The Fifth Estate's Judy Trin starts with that moment. At least eight heavily armed police crashed the door and set off a flashbang grenade, carrying out a no-knock search warrant. That's all they had to do, come to the door and knock. But they came like terrorists. What Ben Poirier didn't know was that his startled stepson had jumped out the bedroom window. He fell 12 stories to his death. A horrifying discovery for his mother, who returned home to a crime scene. In my heart and my mind, it was, he's still alive. I just need to, I just need to touch him. I just need to touch him. House 23-year-old son Anthony was awaiting trial after getting caught with drugs and a gun during a traffic stop. He was out on bail wearing a GPS ankle bracelet to monitor his movements. Who doesn't have made a mistake in life in one way or another? He just needs support. He had so much good in him. We, we talked about our future, what might happen, what, what we could do. He, he was a good, good big brother. Ottawa police carry out hundreds of raids each year. In February, a judge said a no-knock warrant like this reflects a casual disregard for charter rights and urged police to use them in vital cases only. The trade-off for not losing a little bit of drugs that could be flushed down the toilet and endangering people's lives is just not a trade-off that the, that the courts would condone. 
After the raid, police found Ao's 12-year-old brother sleeping in the same room. His 94-year-old grandma and his 13-year-old sister were also home. Ontario's police watchdog has assigned four investigators to determine what happened. But the family isn't confident they'll get what they want. Only 5% of the watchdog's cases results in charges. Judy Trin, CBC News, Ottawa. The City of Montreal will advertise next week for a new commissioner whose job will be to root out systemic racism. So we can find a person who can help us to uh, move efficiently and uh, as fast as possible, of course, by creating an action plan in the next, in the next coming months. The mayor said the new commissioner will be equipped with a staff, including a specialist in the area of racial profiling. Back in March, an internal report accused the city of ignoring systemic racism and recommended the creation of this new commissioner post. This is shaping up to be a Thanksgiving like none other across Canada. We usually serve buffet, but this time it's going to be plated. Nobody else is going to be in the kitchen. Ahead on the National, preparing to give thanks in a pandemic. It's a war zone. And we're the ones on the front line. And is it too soon for your favorite TV show to tackle COVID-19? You have a huge opportunity to not just entertain, but to hopefully inform. And the Canada-US border towns fighting to form their own bubble. More than half my friends live over here, and so I can't go visit them. We're back in two. There were 318 candidates, 211 individuals, and 107 organizations. And today, the awards committee chose one. The Norwegian Nobel Committee has decided to award the Nobel Peace Prize for 2020 to the World Food Programme. It called the UN agency a driving force in preventing the use of hunger as a weapon of war. Last year, it helped close to 100 million people in 88 countries. And Canada is a major contributor in both money and personnel. Cam McIntosh has the details. In South Sudan, UN aid drops like these are as essential as ever. Even with the civil war over, 7 million people, 60% of the population, is struggling to find food. Climate change and conflict are just making a mess of the situation here. Marwa Awad of Ottawa is one of dozens of Canadians working with the United Nations World Food Program. To her, a Nobel Prize highlights the urgency of growing global hunger. This uh, Nobel Peace Prize comes at a very um, critical time when we're seeing uh, the reversal of some of the achievements of the organization. The World Food Program uses the United Nations political sway and logistics to bring aid to some of the most remote and dangerous parts of the world. It warns conflict, climate change, and now COVID-19 could double the number of hungry people globally. We need that support from Canada, from individuals, from the government. From Julie Marshall is the program's spokesperson in Canada. This has come at a good time because what we're doing here is we're able to put the spotlight on the 690 million people that really need to be fed right now. At $250 million a year, Canada is one of the largest and longest standing contributors through successive decades and governments. Regardless of your political leanings in Canada, we as Canadians are, are called upon and we respond to that call. And there are calls to be doing even more. Action Against Hunger is one of numerous NGOs that relies on the World Food Program. I hope that people are paying attention because it's not over. You cannot really have peace and stability in any country if children go hungry every day. The Nobel Committee did call on world governments to pay more attention to hunger. This award, less a celebration of achievement, more of a call to action. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. China says it will be joining the global initiative for what's described as the fair distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine. It is a major boost for the WHO-led initiative known as COVAX. Its aim is to deliver at least 2 billion doses of approved vaccines by the end of next year and ensure equitable access to them. More than 170 countries, including Canada, have signed on. Neither the United States nor Russia have joined. India has nearly 7 million cases of COVID-19. Globally, that's second only to the United States. 
And this week, the number has grown an average of more than 69,000 a day. Renee Filipponi shows us why there's concern that things could get worse. The oldest graveyard in New Delhi is forced to expand as nearly 1,000 people in India are dying of COVID every day. All of that land has been filled up, says this grave digger. We were allocated more and the machine is here to create some fresh space. In crowded cities, the virus has spread quickly. With a hard lockdown in the spring, India avoided the first wave, but is seeing a spike now. People have stopped taking this seriously, says this man. There is no social distancing and people only wear masks when they see the police. On a per capita basis, its numbers are still lower than the U.S. or even France or Spain, but the virus is moving from cities to rural areas, and that is a big concern for health experts. The COVID tests are not available when people have uh, the need for care, there are no healthcare institutions close by for them to turn to. This epidemiologist predicts the number of cases is potentially 10 times higher than the official count and says stigma is a real problem. It deters testing, it deters treatment seeking, which is very important. Uh, but this is also on the supply side. There's a lot of people who don't want to you know, provide COVID care. Overall numbers have dropped in recent weeks, but there are concerns that trend won't last as the country heads into festival season, which usually means large gatherings. The government is warning people to follow the rules. I believe this is the biggest need of the hour, says the Indian health minister. This could be the biggest service to society, the country and mankind. But today, markets in New Delhi are packed. No physical distancing here, even as the virus infects tens of thousands every day. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Next, the challenges of stand-up comedy during a pandemic. I was discovering a new side of myself. Uh, the <laughs> the Don Rickles of the Zoom scene. It was a weird... My conversation with two very funny Canadians about adapting like the rest of us and why laughter is more important than ever. What we're up against now is unlike anything that came before. And hit TV shows decide to tackle COVID-19 this season, but is it too soon? Primetime TV has largely been an escape from the pandemic, but that's about to change with several series planning storylines involving COVID-19. But as Eli Glasner found out, not everyone thinks that's the right move. It's a war zone, and we're the ones on the front line. Channel surf a few weeks from now, and you'll notice a reoccurring guest star. From This Is Us to The Morning Show and more, the virus is making an appearance. Even the kids of South Park are feeling it. You really want to spend the next year on Zoom? All right, children, welcome back to class. And when Grey's Anatomy returns for season 17, what we're up against now is unlike anything that came before. The doctors will be on the front lines. I always knew I could be a good doctor. When the Canadian creator of The Good Doctor returned to work, he says the choice was clear. But it is the biggest thing that's going on in every one of our lives. And it's a medical show. You know, it's a show about doctors. And so the season begins with the pandemic in progress. You have a huge opportunity to not just entertain, but to hopefully inform, hopefully open some eyes and and make people think about things a little differently. I think a lot of what is interesting about it, and I think what showrunners are probably struggling with right now is timing. But some think it's too soon to explore a story nowhere near its conclusion. Do you do it in two or three years, you know, when, you know, maybe it's not so fresh in people's minds and not so, um, you know, maybe even traumatic? I'm here. For the creator of the CBC series Digstown, the solution is focusing on the world post-COVID, everything from tenant rights to mental health. I feel like there's something that's interesting about the pandemic where I'd really like to explore, you know, the toll and the consequences of, you know, this social isolation on people. And that's where producers find themselves caught between offering escape and introspection. There are these incremental changes that you're just like, well, you have to deal with that because there's consequences a place to reflect what we're going through together. 
Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Last month, I did a story about the ways performers are coping with the pandemic, and among them, two Canadian comedians, Ivan Decker and Ali Hassan. I want to play a little more from that interview as they talk about some of the challenges, including one that almost all of us can relate to, how communicating with Zoom may be a problem, but for them, also a potential punchline. Okay, so let's talk first of all about the Zoom shows. Ivan, how is Zoom for comedy? Uh, it's not good, um, because... People are muted, first of all. It's the only way to make it work. The audience has to be completely muted. So as a comedian, you're not getting any feedback from anybody in the audience, other than you can kind of look at their tiny little face and maybe they'll smile, but that's it. You know, it's like performing for the apps on your phone. It's very weird. And not to be indelicate, but what about the money part of it? How do you get paid for a Zoom show? Yeah, you don't really. I mean, some of them have like a tipping structure, so you'll have a, something like PayPal or Venmo in the States. Uh, at the bottom of the screen and people watching the show can send you money, which is kind of nice. Uh, I mean, if you don't do well, you don't get anything. So it's really more of a like feast or famine. But Ali, did you do anything on Zoom? Any comedy stuff? I, I did. I did. And, and, and like Ivan, I didn't particularly enjoy it. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a beggars can't be choosers situation. So you're like, all right, this is what we have. This is what we'll, we'll mess around with. And the, you know, the first one uh, kind of stank, and the next one was a storytelling show, and that was a little bit better. And by the third or fourth, I was like, I was just basically roasting audience members. I was like, Khalil, what do you what do you use to shave your head? Is that coconut oil? What do you got there? Like, I just, what do, where do you live? You live in a Moroccan shisha house? What kind of couch is it? I was just, you know, the comedy was gone. I was discovering a new side of myself. Uh, the so the so Don adaptable. Rickles of the Zoom scene. It was a weird, you know, I just became somebody I didn't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know what I was doing there. <laughs> right, we all had Zoom parties. Those are not parties. Have you ever been to a party where there's 13 people and only one person talks at once? It's a terrible time. It's an intervention. <laughs> So since Zoom is clearly not the answer to comedy in a pandemic, when I spoke to Ivan and Ali, they were just starting to do some small, physically distanced shows. I'll ask each of you this, but, but you first, Ivan. You're doing an outdoor show on Saturday? Yes. What's that? Do you have a sense of what that's going to be like? I think it'll be great. I don't know. I'm, I'm optimistic about it. I mean, any chance now to perform is... Uh, like, I'll never say no to a gig. It's very funny, because, you know, it used to be I would be... You know, I was trying choosy. to get too big for my, my britches. Yeah, yeah, I'd be like, I don't even put on pants for less than $200. Where is it? Burnaby? No chance. <laughs> now I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll drive. What is it, a Walmart parking lot? Three towns over? Let me do five minutes. Well, this is going to be somebody's backyard, is that right? Yeah, so the one on Saturday is in, is in a backyard. And, and, you know, I think it's great. The, the feeling that I keep getting is people do want this. They need it. It's so nice to have that levity because of the amount of uh, just like fear and uncertainty in the world, it's, it's really nice to join together with a group of people and just laugh, even if you are six feet away from them uh, or outside. I mean, now it's Vancouver, so weather permitting, we'll see what happens. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be sunny, so that's good. And what about you, Ali? What's your next actual planned thing? Yeah, well, there's a couple of outdoor shows. Uh, both happen to be on boats for some reason. I'm not sure why uh, the comedy boat industry is showing a, an interest in me, but I'm 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 into it. I don't, uh, I don't. Well, one is actually on a dock performing to people who are in boats, and one is standing in a boat. We're going back to our roots. Almost every comedian who is worth their weight was raised with this idea of any stage time is good stage time. In in Western Canada, you'll meet hundreds of comedians who have driven eight hours to do seven, 10 minutes. They've all, they've all done it, they've all done it. Our distance for driving was a little less in, in the east, but I, I would drive to Ottawa, Montreal, Ottawa to do five minutes. This is the only skill I have. Uh, I have nothing else. <laughs> Yeah, our resumes are a disaster. Comedians' resumes, just oh, yeah. massive gaps. I thought about that. The last, I, went, I thought about the last time I made a resume was 2008. I think it still had babysitting on it. So I don't know if that's going to work. Well, your eulogies write themselves. They told jokes right till the end. <laughs> right till the end. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this is not... We haven't painted a great picture, Ian, and I, I apologize for that, but that is the reality. And, and, and also... Uh, it, there's a lot of people in similar situations. Well, you guys are terrific. You're thoughtful, and I really appreciate your time. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having us. My pleasure, Ian. Thank you so much.
And that was just part of our conversation, which was, as you can see, a lot of fun. You can watch more of the interview on the CBC News app and on our YouTube channel. Next on The National. Quite possibly, uh, we'll be isolated for the foreseeable future. The two towns along the Canada-US border separated by a pandemic now fighting to form their own bubble. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Two picturesque towns along the Canada-US border are fighting for the right to bubble together. They straddle the Alaska-BC border, separated by a clear-cut line and a COVID travel ban. But in many ways, the two communities are as one and rely heavily on each other. Briar Stewart shows us how people there are working together even as they're apart. It's a weekly bonfire between neighbors complete with beverages. It's similar to gatherings held in yards across the country, except this one is on the Canada-US border. He's essential. With all non-essential travel cut off between the two countries, this is one of the only ways for two remote communities to connect as the sun sets along the border. A lot of people that don't get to see family and like the young kids across the border don't get to go to school every day. For almost 50 years, uh, I've shared a very close relationship with people in Stewart, and I've now been cut off from them. In this isolated corner of British Columbia, you're likely to pass more bears and glaciers than towns. Right on the border of the Alaskan Panhandle lies Stewart, B.C., population 400. Next door is Hyder, Alaska, with 63 people. It's a far cry from the 10,000 who settled here during the gold rush. These days, there are still mines, and Canadian workers drive through Hyder every day to reach one of them. Everyone else is no longer allowed to cross back and forth. My foot is soaked. Not even children to go to school. See, that's why you go barefoot. Hilma and Deli Corpola live in Hyder. They were planning to join their friend Kaylin Carey, a Canadian, in Stewart this year to go to elementary school. The border closures changed that. I'm really sad because, like, there's a lot of friends at, like, over there and there's barely any in Hyder. So instead, they've been coming to an area next to the Canadian border station for play dates. The only school in Hyder closed last year, so the Corpolas are being homeschooled. I don't think it's really fair, because how can we get the COVID? Do we get the COVID from trees or bears? We're like the end of the line. Just up the hill, residents use the border station parking lot to meet up and drop off food. Hey, she is taking eggs. One dozen eggs yeah. is totally fine. <laughs> and other necessities. I have snacks and feminine hygiene products. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's no grocery store in Hyder or gas station, so one member from each household is allowed to cross into Stewart each week to run errands. Dick Simpson first came to Hyder in the 1970s. On our side of the boundary, people are there purely because they like being there. But they are reliant on the town next door and carry Canadian currency. Every two weeks, Simpson comes here to do laundry and pick up groceries. Sirloin and potatoes. But he isn't allowed any social calls. It's tough. Socially, half my friends, more than half my friends, live over here. And so I can't go visit them. So you know we... For many, that's the toughest part. And Simpson says it's led some to find other ways over the border. That's been happening for a little over 100 years here. If you look back to our, our prohibition, there was more than one bottle of Canadian whiskey found its way across that boundary. But breaking the law today can carry strict consequences, so most follow the rules and are pushing to change them. With winter around the corner and the prospect of more isolation, some believe there's a pressing need to address the border issue here now. They're lobbying Washington, D.C. and Ottawa to have this whole area as its own bubble. bubble. They've staged Bear protests bubble. and written letters. You know, we want to do right by communities. The we MP for right the area right met with the Minister for Public Safety about relaxing the rules. This seems like a pretty common sense thing that should be able to be dealt with uh, quite efficiently. And yet it's been well over a month since I met with the minister and, and we just haven't seen any progress. 
Hyderites were relieved when three Canadian logging companies dropped off truckloads of wood to help get them through the winter. People are trying to prepare themselves for the dark, cold months ahead when they could feel even more cut off. And I have to kind of be prepared for that. I have to put that in my head that, that quite possibly uh, we'll be isolated for the foreseeable future. For now, the weekly trips into town are his only physical connection to the world outside Hyder. As a global pandemic and a rigid border separate two link communities. Briar Stewart, CBC News on the Stewart Hyder border. Next, preparing for Thanksgiving in a pandemic. But first, as we go to break, we ask some of you what you're thankful for this year. I'm thankful for my friends and my family. What are you thankful for this year, Cairo? That the coronavirus is not here in Gale and I. For my 88-year-old mom and dad, who are both in great health. We're thankful for, for this day. We got yeah. married today. Yeah. Well, we're thankful, I think, for our, our family and our health and just having nice days to spend together. And You've learned that we take a lot of things for granted. And this year has really, like, tested us all. <laughs> It has been a challenging and, yes, unprecedented year. And with COVID restrictions in many parts of Canada, this Thanksgiving weekend will be very different. As Greg Rasmussen tells us, it's a time maybe to let go of some old traditions and make some new ones. This one! Finding just the right pumpkin for that traditional Thanksgiving dessert can be a heavy lift. I like pumpkin pie because I like pumpkin seeds. Sharon, look at this one. This family has a normally busy pumpkin patch mostly to themselves as they plan a different sort of Thanksgiving dinner. Well, it's smaller, just the immediate family. We usually serve buffet, but this time it's going to be plated. Nobody else is going to be in the kitchen. We made uh, provisions. We kind of widened the paths. And the farmer running the popular fall attraction made changes to his corn maze and flower patch but business is still down by about two thirds. There's, you know, about 25, 30 acres here for people to wander around. Um, so there's definitely some room to find some spaces. In. For some, a visit to the farm is part of a scaled back weekend. We're keeping it to just nuclear family. We're being very socially responsible with uh, a lot of precautions and social distancing. It's a similar story across Canada as people rethink the holiday weekend. Even though there are only a few cases within the Atlantic bubble, most at this university are staying put. It's a tough call to not go home, but I think like what we have right now, like we're so lucky to be in the bubble um, and have everybody so safe. Other changes, hard hit restaurants suggesting you create a bubble and let them do the dicing to keep people from mingling in the kitchen. Everything is going to come uh, pre-prepped, pre-ready to go. And so there's minimal people having to be involved in the actual cooking. So big and slippery. For many, this weekend will be a struggle. Longing for the tastes of home while being told to stay apart. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Richmond, B.C. Love that pumpkin patch. Next on the National, a farmer reaps the benefits from an act of kindness. How his community pitched in when he needed it most. Our moment is next. Seventeen-year-old Morgan Harms was hit by a car last week while she was out for a run. She suffered a concussion, but thankfully is okay now. But Morgan's dad is a farmer, and in the aftermath of the panic caused by her accident, he still had to get the harvest in, and that's when the community decided to help. It's our moment. My daughter went out for a run in the evening. Uh, we got a call that she had been hit by a driver. Winnipeg is two hours from where we live, so she was there. Some of the guys that uh, I know quite well, we go to church with, decided that they wanted to come help them and do some combines for us. They came in with seven or six combines, and I was there with our combine as well. We did 500 acres in four and a half hours. It would have probably taken me five days to do the same thing, even though it, well, my daughter was sitting in the hospital room. It was kind of fun harvesting that. I'm a somewhat private, get it done myself kind of guy. So I had to step back and let them, let the guys help. When there's crises, the farming community rallies around them. We got to bring home, Morgan home yesterday. This Thanksgiving is going to be 
a special one, that's for sure. We are extremely thankful. We can all hope, and I think this is probably true, that in our many communities across the country, our neighbours would kind of respond that way when we need them. But there's something grand about all those combines in a line. My wife read that piece on cbcnews.ca and was in tears by the end of it, which I think more eloquently than me says how moving that is. That is the National for October 9th. I'll be back here on Sunday and on CBC Radio's Cross Country Checkup. I hope you tune in. Good night.